Well, hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson, and the night light is on for Friday, March 29th, 2024. Have you ever felt like you just wanted to quit your job and run away and join the circus? You're about to meet someone who actually did that. Jack Lepiars used to be a public radio colleague of mine before he changed careers completely, but he has his reasons. He's gonna tell his story and take your questions next. Something you should hear before you think about making a huge life change, you might be interested in his story. Plus, did you hear Beyonce just dropped a new album? Are you sure it's her? You should know about the latest advance in AI voice technology. Be sure to go to nightlightjoshua.com for all of my links or email me joshua at nightlightshow.com. It is good to be with you on this Good Friday, wherever you're watching, especially over on YouTube. I hope you will go follow me on YouTube at Nightlight Joshua, where you can be a part of our live chat, especially because Jack Lepiaris is joining us live tonight. We haven't had a live guest on the show yet, so it'll be very exciting for you to put your questions and thoughts in the chat. If you've ever seen him perform, I'd love to hear your thoughts and reactions on how it was and what you took from it or otherwise. I'd just love to hear your questions for him once he tells his story. You, remember, you can also watch Remember on Facebook or Twitch or X, but would definitely love you to follow over on Nightlight Joshua, where we have our usual frequent flyers for the evening. Joseph, hello. Happy Friday to you. Lauren, hello. Welcome. Good to see you. Jean Lewis, welcome. Happy Friday to you as well. Solange the First, yes, I like your comment. She says, I really have to hear this story. Yes, <laughs> you really do. I think you're going to absolutely enjoy hearing it. Vamp Lakin, I don't think I've seen you in the chat before. Welcome. Good to have you with us. Vamp Lakin writes, this should be fun. It will be. I definitely believe it will be. Holly, hello. Good to see you. Kristen, welcome on the YouTube chat. Lovely Friday surprise, Kristen writes. Yes, good. I wanted to do something a little different for Friday than just kind of the regular news of the day. So hopefully this is something that you'll enjoy. Skylar the Rider, hello. Good to see <laughs> Skylar writes, happy Friday, everyone. We made it, unlike my diet. Oh, now, Skylar, don't beat yourself up. It's, you know, it's, it's just, you know what? It's, um, it's a holiday weekend. So we're just gonna call it a holiday break, huh? Right? We're gonna give you we're gonna give you a little dispensation from your diet just for today because it's Easter, and if Jesus didn't want us to enjoy treats on Easter, he wouldn't have invented chocolate eggs. There you go. You can look it up. Pam, hello to you. Good Friday to you and to all of you who are celebrating Easter weekend. I hope you have a blessed Easter weekend from Maundy Thursday all the way to Resurrection Sunday. Shopping CD, hello, Whippersnappers. Good to see you too. Dana, hello. Good to see <laughs> And Vamp says, hey, from the Whippersnappers. I'm glad we have an intergenerational Whippersnapper conversation going on. Although, do you mean Whippersnappers as in fans of Jacques or people who are about to be fans of Jacques? Because I think once you see what he does and why he made this decision you might just become a fan as well. We're gonna to talk to Jack in just a second. I did wanna to get to one newsier item at the beginning of the show that I saw that I took an interest in that I think you might be interested in as well. If you follow me on social, I've already kind of posted about this because it sort of shocked me and I'm not exactly sure what to make of it, but I wanna show it to you and let you see for yourself what this is all about. So you know today, Beyonce dropped her new hotly anticipated country album. Cowboy Carter is getting a whole lot of attention. It's got collaborations on there with Dolly Parton and Willie Nelson, and the early reviews are extremely positive. And apparently it is an amazing, I think, 27-track album. And I think hearing Beyonce in this way is exciting for a lot of people, especially since country music usually has only tacitly acknowledged the presence of African Americans and people of color much more now in recent years than in the past. And now, frankly, Nashville is a very multicultural industry, if you look at it compared to previous years. We've come a long way from the days of Charlie Pride, right? From Charlie Pride to Beyonce. And I think that's kind of cool. And I was gonna do something about just, you know, Beyonce's sound as a country artist and some of the, the kickback. Now, a few reasons I didn't do this. One, the kickback right now seems to be coming mostly from trolls. And if there's one thing we know about trolls, it's that you never feed them. The other reason I chose not to get into this is because if I was gonna talk about Beyonce's sound, I saw this post online that made me think about our sounds 
all of them. I don't know if you saw this, but if you follow me online, you saw that I shared this post from OpenAI, the company that created ChatGPT. The post reads, we're sharing our learnings from a small scale preview of Voice Engine, a model which uses text input and a single 15 second audio sample to generate natural sounding speech that closely resembles the original speaker. So I went to the post. It is kind of remarkable how much they've been able to do in a fairly short period of time, or rather how much they are revealing in this short period of time. And what they basically did is they put a few samples of what Voice Engine can do. Essentially what it does is this technology, which they've been developing since kind of the end of 2022, will take a 15 second sample of a real person's voice as reference audio. And then it can generate other audio based on the reference voice. Here's an example, for example, of someone speaking in English, and then they use that to generate audio of, say, science lessons about biology and chemistry and physics. So first, let me play you the original reference audio. This is the real person speaking. Force is a push or pull that can make an object move, stop, or change direction. Imagine you're riding a bike down a hill. First, the push you give off the ground is the force that gets you going. So that was the real person's voice. This is the generated voice that Voice Engine created talking about biology. Some of the most amazing habitats on Earth are found in the rainforest. A rainforest is a place with a lot of precipitation and it has many kinds of animals, trees, and other plants. Tropical rainforests are usually not too far from the equator and are warm all year. Did you catch that? So the first one was the real person. The second one was not a real person. And that is how dramatically the technology has advanced. By the way, I know in previous shows we've had audio issues and going back and forth with web audio. Let me know if you have trouble in the chat and I will diagnose that. But that's kind of where the technology has gone. One of the other things that technology is able to do is go from language to language. So for example, this is a clip of someone who is an English speaker giving a piece of reference audio, and they translate it from English into Spanish, Mandarin, German, French, and Japanese, but with the same intonation and vocal quality of the original speaker. Again, here's the reference audio. Friendship is a universal treasure. It brings joy, support, and laughter into our lives no matter where we are in the world. True friends stand by us through thick and thin, sharing our joys and easing our sorrows. Let's celebrate the bonds of friendship that connect us all across every language and culture. And now here, based on that reference audio, is the same person saying the same thing in Spanish. La amistad es un tesoro universal. Aporta alegría, apoyo y risas a nuestras vidas sin importar dónde estemos en el mundo. Los verdaderos amigos están con nosotros en las buenas y en las malas, compartiendo nuestras alegrías y aliviando nuestras penas. Celebremos los lazos de amistad que nos conectan a todos a través de cada idioma y cultura. So you could hear in the way that it regenerated the audio, it still has some of kind of the verbal qualities of the original speaker, including that, and I'm saying this as a person of color who grew up in South Florida, that kind of gringo Spanish quality, it didn't turn it into a perfect sounding Spanish that sounds like someone who grew up speaking Spanish. It sounds like a person for whom Spanish is a second or third or fourth language adapted through the lens of a native English speaker. Wild, right? But it gets wilder. They also made it speak Mandarin. 友谊是一种普遍的财富，无论我们身在世界何处，它都会给我们的生活带来快乐、支持和笑声。真正的朋友在我们经历风风雨雨时，与我们并肩，分享我们的快乐，减轻我们的悲伤。让我们倾注友
of using reference audio to translate into dialects of Swahili for things like providing nutritional information for people in parts of South Africa that may be underserved by health and nutritional information. There's another item that uses reference audio of someone who's had, I believe it was a, uh, a brain tumor or, or a, um, a neurologic disorder. Uh, yeah, a vascular brain tumor of a young woman who was able to speak normally, fluently, typically, had a brain tumor and lost her ability to speak. And so they used reference audio from her past to create generative audio of her as she would have sounded but for having that vascular brain tumor. It's amazing technology. It's also kind of worrisome once I read the New York Times write-up of this. And once I read something else from the journal that kind of exemplifies my concern. So the Times did a piece about this coming out, this article being dropped. And they have not released the technology. OpenAI has not released the technology because, according to the New York Times, they're still trying to figure out the potential dangers a product manager for OpenAI, Jeff Harris, told the New York Times, quote, this is a sensitive thing and it is important to get it right, unquote. So at least it's not for sale today. That's a good thing. Maybe I am paranoid, but I don't think that I am in worrying and being concerned about what this could mean based on something that happened right here. I live in Las Vegas and some of you remember that last year there was a really remarkable hack attack against MGM Resorts here in Vegas. MGM is one of the two big casino chains here in Vegas. Caesars Entertainment is the other one. So MGM owns the MGM Grand, the Luxor, the Excalibur, Mandalay Bay, New York, New York. They own a bunch of casinos up and down the strip. And they got hacked. And the Wall Street Journal just put out this really interesting not at all a long, long read, like a good tight read about how the hack happened. They talked to people from MGM. They talked to some anonymous sources. There was one source who claimed to be one of the hackers who was later debunked as not being one of the hackers. But the key to this, I think, that's interesting is twofold. First of all, they described some of the people who were behind this hack and how they did what they did. These are not necessarily people, according to the journal, who are in this to like show their coding prowess or to send a message to the world. They are thieves. They are young people, including a lot of teenagers, who are doing this for money and for prestige. In other words, they're teenagers. But the other thing that they noted is that a lot of what they use is stolen. That, that the materials are even stolen. Among other things, this hacking collective that the MGM hackers came out of, according to the journal, has um, used a mix of different techniques, including stealing the source code to an unreleased version of the video game Grand Theft Auto. So if they could steal code from Take Two, which makes Grand Theft Auto, why couldn't they steal code from OpenAI? God forbid this got out into the wild. And all it takes is for the bad guys to be right once. So someone steals this code or hacks it or approximates it, and then it's out in the wild, and then God knows what Beyonce music we could hear next. I know that sounds crazy and sci-fi, and maybe it is. Maybe OpenAI won't be getting hacked. God forbid they are. Here's the larger concern, and it's right at the top of the Wall Street Journal article. Here's how the article begins. The break-in began on an otherwise typical Las Vegas Friday night. Step one was a phone call to MGM Resorts tech support. The person on the line said they were an employee but had forgotten their password and were locked out of their account. They gave some personal information over the phone. It all checked out. What tech support didn't realize was that the caller was a hacker. A few minutes later, the real MGM employee received a notification that his password had been reset and reported this to the IT department. By then, it was too late. The hackers were in. Over the next five days, a brash group of cyber criminals would try to take more than $30 million from MGM. For the hackers, it was the ultimate game and a shot at defying the oldest rule in Vegas. The house always wins. 
do you see how they got in? Not because they hacked their way in, but because we let them in. It happens all the time. Those of you who have a password that's password, or it's the number one, two, three, four, five, six, you are an enemy of democracy. I mean, these are the kinds of things that hackers exploit. I have a very, very good friend whose job is what's called pen testing. It's penetration testing, literally figuring out where the weaknesses are in IT systems and helping companies to close them. And one of the easiest ways to get your information is to ask you for it. It's remarkable how simple it is. So if someone could pull off something like this, not because they were able to aggressively hack their way in, but because they knew who to ask and they had stolen just enough information to get in. If you can do this to a system of this kind, God forbid that a real hacker, someone who really knows their stuff, actually could get some of this source code or even approximate it. That's a big problem. Make it even worse. I found a report from Congressional Research Service that came out just this month. And those of you who watch this show know, I love the Congressional Research Service. It is a fantastic place to go. Remember not too long ago, there was this like weird deep fake video of Joe Biden supposedly saying stuff. And then the campaign came out and said, no, it's not the president. He didn't really say it. This has come up in Congress this month because, according to the Congressional Research Service, the Federal Election Commission was trying to figure out what to do about AI fakes, whether or not there was a way to regulate that under the existing law. It's called the Federal Election Campaign Act. And according to the Congressional Research Service, last June, they voted on whether or not to try to put out a rulemaking petition, and they deadlocked on it. And the reason was they weren't sure that the law gave them the latitude to do so. Now, that doesn't mean nothing is going to happen at all, ever. But it means that the possibility of this getting clamped down on quickly gets much harder because they're not sure that the laws exist to make this happen. We've already talked about how gummed up things are in Washington right now, especially with a House Republican majority that doesn't even like each other let alone being able to get things done. I mean, there's still talk of throwing out House Speaker Mike Johnson. Whether that'll happen or not, who knows? But there's at least talk of it. So in that political environment, being able to get Congress, the House or the Senate, to move fast on something that already exists seems kind of unlikely. There are a few things that I think might be reason for hope. I don't want to bum you out completely on Good Friday, but there are a few things that might be reason for hope, and I'll give you two of them. One, at least the current administration, and I don't know if this is going to work or not, but the Biden administration has begun to announce certain policies that would prevent federal agencies from the misuse of AI. And they listed a couple of things in a statement that came out this week that would be covered by this. For example, if you're traveling at the airport, you'll still be able to opt out of TSA using facial recognition technology without slowing you down or losing your place in line. If a federal healthcare system like, say, the VA or TRICARE, which treats military service members, is making diagnostic decisions using AI software, they'll still always be overseen by a human being. So that a trained person with federal training and with the responsibility of being a federal employee will be standing in the gap between you and the technology. Or when they use AI, for example, in fraud detection which, with government services, which is a huge deal. You remember how much money was taken fraudulently during COVID, in COVID funds. So this can be hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. That if AI is used to make decisions, there's also still a level of human oversight. According to the statement from the White House, they've already put this policy directive out there, and every part of the federal government, all the agencies that were covered by this, met their deadlines to report their plans to act on this executive order. And the Biden administration is doing this by executive order. That means that whoever the president is after Joe Biden, whether it's Donald Trump in this election or someone else in the election thereafter, this may or may not last because it's an executive order. So it still requires us to write law, to write policy on this. This might have kicked the can a little bit down the road, but not not really that far. The other thing that I think is interesting here is the way in which we are kind of protecting ourselves from screwy information online. And we are able to do some self-protection. And 
I, I, I found something online that I think you'll find interesting. Columbia University and the Aspen Institute did an event a few days ago, actually this week, actually I think it was just yesterday, about the impact of AI on elections. And the CEO of a division of Google called Jigsaw, which deals with data security, spoke during that program. I wanna play you a piece of what she said about how young adults, Gen Zers, deal with information online, specifically news and information. And I found this interesting because this is not the way that I use news. I'm, I don't know if it's the way that you use news, but I think there's a, a window of opportunity here. Here's a piece of what was said at this session at Columbia University this week. How many people here read the comments underneath news articles? Hmm. You say that's about maybe half, two thirds. Well, I'll tell you who, who reads the comments. Gen Z. Gen Z. And, and the interesting thing is not that they read them as much as, as, um, as when and why. When do they read the comments? They often go headline, comments, and then the article. Why would they be doing it in that order? Because, and this is according to them in this research that we did, um, they want to know if the article is fake news. So you see the inversion there. Like I would look to the article as the journalists being, you know, the authoritative uh, uh, curators of information, and they are interviewing experts who are authorities. And um, Gen Z, and I think increasingly, they're looking for, s for social signals about how to situate the, the kind of the information, the claims, and the relevance to them. So that was Yasmin Green, the CEO of Jigsaw, which is a division of Google, speaking at this forum at Columbia University this week. I find that really fascinating and kind of heartening because it signals to me that at least on some level, Gen Zers know there's a lot of stupid stuff out there and they have to kind of defend one another to an extent. Now, the comments are still the comments, so it's still problematic. But maybe there's a future, for example, in news organizations getting in the comments. Maybe there are ways for trusted sources of information to be part of that conversation, where it doesn't have to be like at NPR that has to be in the comments, but maybe, you know, a reporter or someone who's on the team or a producer or a social media, you know, producer or writer who is known and kind of builds a profile of being one of those voices you find in the comments. If people are moving that way, then maybe there's a way to move that way as well. Of course, then you have to worry about AI being in the comments. So it's always a chicken and egg problem. But what this says to me, at least, is that there is some cognizance among young adults that something in the milk ain't clean, as the old folks used to say, and that they need to kind of protect themselves. Maybe if that instinct continues, then those of us who work in reliable sources of information can meet that need because at least there's interest in it and at least there's a desire to not be gullible and to not look stupid because you share something that's false. We talked earlier this week about that goofy online hoax about Vladimir Putin and black Jesus. Yes, Vladimir Putin and black Jesus. Do not attempt to adjust your set. If you missed it, it was Wednesday's show. It was also yesterday's podcast. Please go check that out because I am, I'm not as mad about it as I was before, but I'm still mad. But at least maybe, there can be a generational switch so that things like this open AI technology can not only not fool everybody, but also that younger adults will demand policy on it. They may make it an electoral issue. Like we can't keep going through life not knowing what's true. You have to write laws on this or we won't elect you. I don't see a groundswell of that yet. Possible, possible. We'll see if that materializes. Let me get to a few of your comments and then I wanna take a quick break and then we'll do the fun stuff with Jack. Holly, I see you on YouTube. Holly wrote, I failed a fishing test last week and was sentenced to training. Do you know how many times I have failed the fishing test? Let me, let me tell you something. When I was at, when I was still on NPR, we were based at WAMU in Washington, I would get the email 
and I would respond to the, I'd click the link and then the link would go to a page that says, you are an idiot. You have been caught by American University IT department and you will be sentenced to 40 lashes. No, it wasn't that bad. But basically it was like, in the future, please be more careful when you receive phishing emails and report the phishing email to fish at american.edu or whatever the address was. And they would hear me cuss in my office. And after a while, they knew exactly why I was cussing in my office because I got fooled over and over and over. And I actually, in my, my ultimate anchor DVD, a moment, went and complained to one of the IT people and was mad that I kept getting caught with this. And he was like, so don't click it. And I was like, yes, you're right. And I stormed off. <laughs> it was, I was, I was so mad. And I was mad because I'm like, it is my job to be smart. How am I this stupid? But it's not stupidity. It's just not something that we're trained to armor ourselves up for. Like that person at the MGM story, it's normal for an employee to be like, hey, I got locked out, I forgot my password, can you help me with this? Okay, fine. It's really hard to say, yeah, I know I just saw you at the water cooler today, but no, I'm not going to help you. That's super uncomfortable, but it's necessary. So I totally understand getting pinched by it. I can relate to you having to be sentenced to training because I was sentenced to training as well. I have since expunged that for my permanent record, and soon I will be getting my right to vote back. I will eventually be an upstanding member of society. Vamp Lakin on YouTube wrote, a lot of people are getting their news from TikTok. Yes, they are. That is a whole other conversation that is problematic, but if they're gonna get their news from there, then at least that's a source where we need to be. We have to figure out how to be in those places, and frankly, I don't know that as much as I'm not on TikTok, and I'm not on TikTok for all the reasons we've discussed on this show, that I think there's a way to be in that space without judging people for being there and without making them feel like, why are you here in this place where there are all these liars and the Chinese government is spying on you? Like that is just, that's a trust breaker. If we can be in those spaces and maybe lead people out once TikTok implodes, which I believe eventually it will, then maybe that's a path forward as opposed to fully disengaging. I am disengaged, but I don't think larger news organizations should, should necessarily pull out completely. And Skylar the writer, I caught your comment on YouTube. Skylar wrote, they've done something like that already. There are YouTube videos of different quote unquote artists singing other people's songs, such as TLC singing Tony Braxton. Yeah, I have seen some of those, and I think that maybe some of those might be okay. We talked about that, um, the AI comedy video. Remember where uh, an a, a online comedy program called Dudesy made an AI comedy video of George Carlin and created what would have been an hour long comedy special of George Carlin doing comedy from the grave. Well, the estate of George Carlin is suing them over that. And I understand why. First of all, it wasn't terribly funny. We played a piece of it for you here and y'all were like, eh? But I do think there might be opportunities for that to be fine. If the artists themselves decide that they wanna be a part of it, then maybe that's an option. The key I think is just that we don't get fooled by it, that nobody takes advantage of us as a result of us being in these online spaces and not really knowing what's true. And I see a comment from Jacques who says, TikTok is a sinking ship. I know that name. Wait a second. Is that? Yes, it is. It is indeed. It is our next guest. He's getting into the chat, but that's okay because he's going to get in the chat with you in just a second because when we come back, I want you to meet this guy. He made a big career change, which I think is super crazy audacious and very, very cool. And frankly, did something that I think a lot of people have joked about doing, but the joke always has a morsel of truth. When people say, I'm gonna run off and join the circus. I think what they really mean is I'm gonna go follow my passion. I'm gonna go follow my instincts. I'm gonna go follow my heart. And that's why I wanted to talk to him about this. If you've never seen his act before, I'm gonna show you some of what he does. He is with us live. He's gonna answer your questions. And I wanna hear from him about how it's gone, the pros, the cons, is it working out? And frankly, what is it actually like to run away and join the circus? Jack Lepiars, AKA Jacques Z. Whipper, is our guest when we come back.
This is The Nightlight. I'm Joshua Johnson. Good to have you with me on this Easter weekend. Remember, you can go to nightlightjoshua.com to find all of my social media links, to subscribe to the podcast, to listen to or watch the show on demand. This show is available as a video podcast on Spotify. You'll also find my Substack where you can read more of my original essays and articles. More recently, I had a piece published, or I published a piece about NBC News deciding to fire Ronna Romney McDaniel as a contributor. As a former NBC News contributor and NBC News anchor, I had some thoughts about that. I also have another piece about the upcoming movie Civil War, which depicts a fictitious civil war here in more or less present time America. Interesting idea but I think the plot might have one gigantic fatal hole in it. I really hope I'm wrong. You'll find the link to my substack at nightlightjoshua.com. Also the merch store, which has Nightlight merch and the ever popular Gullible Ain't Sexy t-shirts. That was a viewer request that we turn into a shirt, which has been a lot of fun. There's also an online tip jar where you can put a few dollars in if you enjoy the program. You can contact me through the site, and you can always email me, joshua at nightlightshow.com. You'll find all these links online at nightlightjoshua.com. I love the idea of following your passion. If there's one thing that I think has led me here to the second bedroom of my apartment here in Las Vegas, it's a desire to be able to live life on my own terms, create the things that are important to me, and find some way to make that sustainable. It's always a little weird to step out into the unknown, even if you kind of know what you want the unknown to be like, and especially if you are known for being something very, very different. You might know today's guest, our live guest, from a couple of different places. And he talked about the intersection between those two worlds in a recent Instagram video where someone asked him, you look like that guy who used to be on that public radio station in Boston, WBUR, or as the receptionist says, WBUI. Was that you? Are you that guy? You look exactly like Jack Lepiar's. Here's how he responded. You know, you are not the first person to say that. So for those of you who don't know, that's Jack Lepiars. He worked at WBUR in Boston for 13 years. And a lot of people always think that I sound like him. Some people even say that I look like him. Personally, I don't really see the resemblance. I mean, like the way we smile, definitely not the same smile lines. I mean, the hair is kind of similar, but he definitely uses way too much product. I prefer a much more natural look. Although I will say, this guy has definitely not been skipping arm day. I don't know if he's been skipping leg day. Probably skips leg day. Besides, I don't think he even works at WBUR anymore. I mean, check out this Boston Magazine Best of Boston 2023 award. Jack Lepiars leaves WBUR. What did he win an award for? Oh. Yeah, if you couldn't tell by now, I am Jack Lepiars, uh, former midday anchor at WBUR News in Boston. Just goes to show you, if you don't feel like you have everything figured out, who knows? Maybe you'll work for 13 years in an industry that you went to school for and then decide in your mid-30s that running away and joining the circus is a better idea. Maybe it is. Has it turned out that way? Let's ask him. Jack Lepiars joins us now. Jack, welcome to the Nightlight. I'm so glad to have you on. It is wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. How are you? I understand you just got back from the road, from being at, I, I just, believe, a Renaissance Festival, right? I just got back from South Florida, from, from uh, you know, your uh, original neck of the woods. And uh, let me tell you, I am, I'm very happy to be back in a part of the country where they believe in the use of turn signals. See, that is, you're in Massachusetts, right? I'm in Massachusetts. Okay, so having been in a car from Logan to Provincetown, I might... <laughs> I might need to call BS on that one, but I guess they used you use turn signals differently, I guess, in Massachusetts. You you kind We've of use them as an order rather than a request, I think. It's it's gone from a ten percent usage to maybe like a thirty to fifty percent usage. So like listen, okay. it, it still ain't good, but it's better. It's better. It's better. How was South Florida? How was performing on the road there? Um, South Florida is, it's, it's a nice way to get in some work at a time when there's not a whole lot going on because most of my performance is outdoors. Um, but let me tell you, uh, performing outdoors in South Florida, even in March is, uh, it is a tough time. Uh, I am very sweaty. All of my costumes need to be dry cleaned. Uh, I have gone through one and a half bottles of Febreze fabric spray, and it's 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 everything struggling. Yeah, it's it's Florida is that way. Florida is that way. Yeah. So you perform with Whips. Your stage name is Jacques Z Whipper. Why Whips? Tell us how you got into that particular kind of performance. 
So I grew up in the circus and my dad, uh, he was a clown with a big apple circus. He did Renaissance festivals before then. And he had a whole laundry list of skills, whip cracking, knife throwing, sword fighting, um, juggling, stilt walking, everything. And so when I was a kid, it was sort of like, okay, what skills do I want to learn? And I saw the whips and the whips looked like fun. And I'd also watched a lot of Indiana Jones. And so when I was seven years old and had the chance to learn some of these skills, um, cause we were working at a, like a summer camp teaching kids, uh, circus skills. I was like, well, I don't want to learn wire walking. I don't want to learn stilt walking. I want to learn how to crack a whip. And so the very first day it took me all day. And at seven years old, I learned how to crack a whip and nearly put out my eye. And I still have a scar, uh, to this day from that first day where I almost put out my eye, but it was worth it though. The scar clearly paid off. <laughs> exactly. And it didn't exactly. scare you off from whips either. No, no, it, it did scare me off from like telling my dad if I hit myself because he was like, hey, don't mess around with this. And then as soon as he turned his back, I immediately messed around with it. Right. But as I got older, and I think this is the honestly, the more real answer was, you know, he was I, I was saying I should learn this circus skill. I should learn this circus skill. Uh, and I specifically said I should learn juggling. And what my dad told me was. The problem with juggling is everyone in the circus knows how to juggle. There are uh, not to say jugglers are a dime a dozen because juggling is a serious skill and it's a hard skill and it's a skill that I never learned because it's hard. Um, but you can put in the same amount of work and become an extraordinary juggler or put in the same amount of work and become a pretty good whip cracker and the level of competition that you will have. There are three whip crackers um, on, on the Renaissance Festival circuit and I'm one of those three. Whereas jugglers, every, I mean, you, you sometimes have three jugglers at the same Renaissance fair. So you learned when you were seven, you I, I kind of continued doing it over the years, over the years, and then you get to a point where you have to figure out what to do with your life, where you have to figure out what you're going to be when you grow up. How did that thought process go? Did you always plan to be in radio? Was it always just kind of a passing fancy to do whip cracking? Was it a tough decision? How, what was that thought process like? It went in stages. So um, when I was basically 11 to about 16, I wanted nothing to do with the circus because my mother, who's now retired also in South Florida, um, she was a college professor. She was very big on me getting a normal education and uh, she hated the circus and I think still doesn't truly enjoy the circus. Um, but so I got a normal education and I was in normal school and being, you know, the circus kid is great when you're seven years old for your social prospects. It's terrible when you're 15 years old. Um, and so for a stretch, I wanted to distance myself from the circus as much as I could. And then I realized that I could make a good amount of money doing the circus. Uh, it, I mean, certainly not nothing extraordinary, but certainly better than the 650 I was making or 625 an hour I was making scooping ice cream. So, uh, I said, okay, well, I have all these skills, let's put them to use. But at the same time, I, I, I knew at the time I wanted to either be an actor or a writer. And I thought, oh, well, broadcasting is kind of like the two of those melded together. There, there's a lot of writing involved, but there's still that performance aspect to it. And so when I went to, to college, I went to Emerson College in Boston. I started working at the radio pretty much day one, um, my, my college radio station. And I found I, I, I enjoyed radio pretty well. Uh, but at the same time, I was street performing on the weekends. I was working Renaissance festivals uh, on the weekends when I could find the work. And I was using that essentially instead of having to get another job. Basically, that was, you know, I could make enough money in the summer and the fall and then just save that money over the winter until we got to spring and I could perform again. Um, and so it was this sort of back and forth between the two until I graduated. And I was expecting to go into the circus. I figured that would be the easier uh, career path for me because I already had a show. Um, I had been doing it my whole life. I figured it would be easy to just make that a permanent fixture. And instead I had interned for WBUR the spring semester of my senior year and they offered me a part-time job. And I was like, all right, well, let's, let's, let's ride this and, and, and see how far it goes. And it, it turned out, I really enjoyed the work. I really liked the work. And, um, that was the path I pretty much stayed on until, uh, I kind of hit a wall and TikTok blew up my performance, uh, prospects in, in a good way. That's, I, that's the long answer to what a very short question. No, that's okay. That's, and I, I'm actually glad you brought that up because you wrote a piece on WBUR.org when you decided to announce that you were leaving. And part of that piece refers 
to what you just described in terms of why radio kind of appealed to you in that way. You wrote in part, quote, I became WBUR's go-to breaking news reporter. The same improvisational skills that had served me on stage helped me stay calm in stressful situations, whether it was the aftermath of a tornado just outside Boston or the Boston Marathon bombings of 2013. And when that ease on air led to me becoming WBUR's midday anchor, reading national newscasts on Here and Now every day, I started cutting down my performance schedule with the intention of making radio my full-time job. But then COVID happened. Suddenly, for the first time in my adult life, I went a year without doing any shows, and it became clear to me that performing was what I truly wanted. For me, the circus has always been an intrinsic part of my identity. Simply put, it's who I am. And on stage has always been where I felt the most free. Some people get nervous before they go on stage, but by assuming the character of Jacques Zewipper and drawing on a stupid mustache, all my social anxiety disappears. To paraphrase one of my closest former co-workers who knew me for years before seeing me on stage, it puts me in my element. Talk a little bit more about that, about being in that element and the absence of it when you took that break. Yeah, it's weird. I think people assume, you know, as a performer that I'm probably an extrovert. I love talking to people. I am one-on-one, -on -one, one of the most awkward people you will ever encounter in your life. A public radio like, person? Socially awkward? No, I, really go I on. know, right? Not possible. It's, I, I remember having to do interviews like this back when I was on the air and like trying to make small talk with guests before we started the interview. And I was so bad at it. And I knew like it was such an important part of the job to like make your guest feel at ease and, and uh, you know, basically help them open up to you during the interview. And I would just be like, hi, how are you? It's good to see you. Hope you're having a good day at like, so. I've never felt really comfortable in in one on one situations unless I know the person well, unless they're a friend of mine. And I think when I go on stage, it's sort of like I remember having this thought when I was street performing in 2014 um, and that I was just doing Jack the Whipper on on the street. Um, and I was street performing at Faneuil Hall, which is one of the premier busking spots in the world um, in Boston. And I was feeling weirdly nervous and I don't usually get nervous before shows and I was like well what if they don't like me and then I, I had this moment of if they don't like you it's not that they don't like you it's they don't like Jack the Whipper it's not that they don't like Jack Lepiars and sort of going out on stage allows me to be freer it allows me to be just a bit more confident because I'm not I'm still myself I'm st I mean Jack the Whipper is Jack Lepiars dialed up to 11 but it's not me you know, it's not they dislike me as a person. They might just not like what I'm doing. And no one is popular with everyone. That's fine. I want to show folks a clip of some of what you do on the stage. But before I do that, talk to me about WBUR and the kind of what they call in theater the moment before, right? The lead up to you realizing like there needs to be a change. What was the moment before for you in terms of right before you were like, yeah, I'm, I'm leaving. It was, it was, it was over COVID. Um, and I was, as I always am for big stories, I was really excited at the start of COVID. I was one of the only people, um, I was the only on air person who was actually in the building the entire time through the, the pandemic. And I was excited to get a chance to cover and help out with this massively important story. It's always, you know, kind of what I've gotten most excited about. And I was really excited about that for about six, seven, eight, nine months. And then at a certain point, it, it just, it became all the same to me. Um, the, 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 the jobs essentially ceased to be fulfilling. And I, I hit this point where I, I started to question, I was like, are we having an effect on the world? And I think it was probably around the time when people were like, oh, the COVID vaccine is going to give you X, Y, and Z, you know, whatever you know, falsification was put out about it. Um, and I was like, are we, are we still, are we accomplishing our goals? Are we doing what we, what we got into this business to do, which is to inform people, to cut through some of the disinformation that's out there. And I think over, over those two years between 2020 and 2022, I just got really jaded and really sick of it. 
Yeah, I can I can relate to that in the, to an extent. I mean, I was I was at NBC during COVID. I got to NBC like a month before COVID hit and shut oh down God. New York and then the world. So like whatever plans I thought I had for all my life was like going to be like a 30 Rock all went right out the window. But there is that initial kind of a feeling of like, this is what I'm here to do, right? I'm not happy about the pandemic, but I'm grateful that I can stand in the gap and make a difference and try to help and try to do some good. And then once that period kind of ends, it's like, okay, let me let me go reacquaint me with me again. And I think for yeah. me, there was a point, and even at, 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 when I was at MSNBC first, then NBC News was like, okay, now we got to build a show for you and figure out where we're going to put you. That process really clarified for me like, oh, I don't actually belong here. Like this is not, this is an amazing place, but creatively, this is not my home. And I don't know where that is, but it's not here. Eventually the company confirmed that, and that's why we're talking right now. But it became really clear, like there was that moment where I had to sort of see myself for the very first time and be like, whatever's next, it has to be a very true reflection of who I am, because fool me twice, shame on me. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think for me, um, what what really stuck in my mind was this this one line actually from another one of our colleagues, uh, Meghna Chakrabarty, uh, from On Point, who I forget what the circumstance was, but it was in, it was in an email she sent to the the, the whole newsroom, and I I forget it pretty much everything else in this email except for one line, which was she said whatever you do for work, you should be so excited for that you lose sleep over um, because you know, you're know you so excited about doing this next project. And I realized um, when I somehow that email came back into my brain some point in that 2020 to 22 phase where I said, you know, I've never felt that way about radio. I have had a lot of fun on radio. I've enjoyed a lot of the work I've done on radio. Um, but the number of times that I've woken up in the middle of the night or had trouble sleeping at night because I'm thinking about things that I want to do on stage or new routines that I want to do on stage. I have on my notes app on my phone, I have, you know, three, four pages of ideas. Um, and once you get that creative brain going, it's hard to stop it. And that, that was, I was, I think that was an aha moment for me. I can definitely relate to the notes thing. You and I are very much alike about that. I'll grab my phone and, and I'll just start yeah. like typing really, really fast. I, I, I have if you the, don't, right? if it, you don't, you forget it. It's gone. You cannot trust your memory. You cannot trust your memory. We are talking to Jack Lepiar, better known as Jacques Z. Whipper, about his decision to make a major career pivot and follow his dreams, his passions into circus performing. I want to show those of you who are new to his work and those of you who are fans, some of whom are in the chat. Hello, welcome. A clip of some of what he does. You sent me, and I'd like you to set this up for me. I pulled two clips of you whipping and singing. Explain the shtick behind that, and then I'm going to play one of them. But explain what that's about. So it came out of this this sort of just like just hanging around, messing around, a whip jam session, as I have been known to call it, with a friend of mine. And we were just cracking whips. Wait, pause on and that. A wait, wait, pause. Hold it. A whip jam session? Yeah, yeah. So whip people yeah, just we sit were... around and they talk about like how they braid and the, and the nice poppers at the end or like the kind of leather you use. Pretty much. Like, like guys sit around talking about cars. They talk basketball. They just talk about, <laughs> they talk about whips. Yeah. Yeah, we were basically just, just kind of hanging around. Um, shooting the stuff and uh, just cracking whips casually as we were talking. Um, and we accidentally, between the two of us, started doing the beat for We Will Rock You, that sh -sh boom, sh -sh boom. And I was like, wait, 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 keep that going, keep that going. We started saying, you know, we will, we will rock you. And then I realized, I was like, oh, wait, we can make a bit out of this. And so it became this sort of just like thing we would do as like a joke bit at the end of shows sometimes or at the end of the day, like we'd have a drink and then go up on stage and do something silly, something stupid. A lot of festivals will will do shows like that. Um, but then I realized that it was a great what we call a pre-show routine. And a pre-show routine is what you do to get people to come to your show. It's a big part of street performing and Renaissance Fair performing, which is similar to street performing in some ways. Um, it's a big part there, which is you kind of do stuff that's loud, flashy, designed to get people's attention so you can get a full crowd before you start your real, your, your good material. 
And it sort of built out of that. And I, I realized I had taken all these improv classes when I was a kid, growing up watching Whose Line Is It Anyway. I In middle school, I was submitting assignments in the form of like made up songs, like change, you know, I took a, a melody and changed the lyrics to submit assignments. Um, and I was like, well, I have this skill. Let's, let's give it to the audience and see if we can, we can improvise songs. And th that has become, I think, my most most popular set at this point, my most popular section of my show. I want to show one of the videos and then I want to take a quick break so I can go back through the chat where quite a few people have begun chatting it up. By the way, for those of you who are watching, <laughs> please feel free to put questions, thoughts in the chat. If you're a fan of Jack, AKA Jacques, please tell us what it was you liked about the act or what you took away from it, or maybe his story about making a career transition resonates with you. Maybe you're in a similar transition or you're thinking about it or you did it and it worked or you did it and it did not work. I would love to hear whatever it is you're willing to share. Feel free to drop those in the chat and I will go through a few of your comments and we'll get to those in a minute. I do want to show you one of these musical whip renditions, which is kind of impromptu, where somebody in the audience asked for you to uh, whip out the song Milkshakes, as in my milkshake brings all the boys to the yard. Here is how that went on stage, watch. Ma'am. <laughs> SpongeBob was the second song in this show for seven years. And I was finally like, oh, let's get some different material. And you're like, no! We only want the classic. All right, ma'am in the back, save us. My whip crack brings all the boys to the yard and they're like, it's better than yours, darn right? It's better than yours, I can whip you. But I have to show As soon as you got to the line, I could whip you, I was like, <gasps> No. Pearls clutched. No. Where's this going? Uh, oh shit! Oh no! Because I'm like, this is gonna be good. <laughs> I love that. I kind of love it because it's it's silly and it's it's a little naughty, but it's also kind of a challenge. Like, I bet you can't do this. And I've got another video I want to play of a guy's like, I bet you can't do yeah. such and such a song, and he almost broke both of your arms off. But I saw that guy actually just two weeks ago, and he, he was trying to get me to do something else. I'm like, no, man, it's too hot to do that one again. Yeah, it, it, and when, when I play it, people will understand. I want to pause in just a second, but how do people react to the whips themselves? Whips connote a lot of different things yeah. to a lot of different people. Uh, one of my uh, viewers, Skylar the writer, let me see if I can find her comment. Skylar jokingly wrote, a white man cracking whips. What kind of circus is this again? So whips connote all kinds of things to all kinds of different people. They yeah. can be, you know, they have historical weight. They can be sexual. They can be all kinds of different things. And I think they're primal and visceral in a way where people don't even know what their reaction is until they actually react. What kinds of reactions do people have when they actually hear that crack for the very first time? I think for the most part, it's the whips are not as loud as you think in real life, um, mostly because I have louder whips. I don't usually use them anymore just because I found it was a little too jarring for a lot of people. So the whips that I use there will get a good, nice snap, but it's not the loud kaboom you would hear from you know, say like the 12 foot whip I used to use in my show. But like, so I used to, I used to not like the sexual side of whips. I used to feel very uncomfortable going to that side of things. In uh, more recent years, I have been leaning to that more and more to help, I think, other people feel a bit more comfortable because like I am aware of what I look like and I am aware of the connotation. And so what I try to do as much as possible and what my character is built around is in the first five minutes of the show my goal is to make myself as unthreatening as possible and that's part of what the mustache is about it was why uh the spongebob theme song was my starting song for so many years because it's like okay yeah it's a white white guy cracking whips but he's also cracking the whips to do spongebob and i i i don't want to start out the show with a disclaimer of like hey this is all you know 
<laughs> I'm not one of those kinds of people, but I want to let people know is subtly intrinsically so that they don't feel threatened. Doesn't always come off as perfectly as I would like to, but I've, I've tried to make that effort. I do want to get more into the impact of the work and the impact you've had on some of your fans. We did hear from one, one viewer who's watching on YouTube, Vamp Lakin wrote, we love you, Jack. You have touched a lot of lives with your community. I want to get into a little more of that when we come back. I do want to talk about the impact that this work has had, how it's gone, what it's like being on the road kind of with the circus, and also just some of the more brass tacks questions about, you know, you did make a very big career choice. And I'm curious to know how that's gone. Pros, cons, ups, downs, and what that's been like. Remember, you can also put some of your questions in the chat, your stories, if you've ever seen Jacques Z. Whipper perform, and we will get to as many of those as we can as the program continues. Good to have you with us on this Easter weekend as we're talking about running away and joining the circus, quite literally. If you think it's something you actually want to do, you need to hear the rest of this guy's story first. More with Jacques Z. Whipper when we come back. Back again to our conversation with Jack Lepiars, better known as Jacques Z. Whipper. Remember to please follow me on YouTube at Nightlight Joshua. If you're enjoying this stream, please hit the like button or whichever emoji suits your mood, but like would be lovely. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel, click the notification bell so you can get more information about when streams begin or when videos are posted. I will often post segments as standalone videos in addition to the live streams, and sometimes I do a few impromptu streams. I also do a monthly Ask Me Anything for some subscribers that I usually release. Sometimes I'll do some unlisted videos as well, so make sure to follow me on YouTube at Nightlight Joshua. Let's get back to our conversation with Jack Lepiars about being Jacques Z. Whipper. I wanna to get to some comments also. I do, <laughs> I love this comment from Skylar the writer who I think I mean, she, she's looking at the screen like everyone else is looking at the screen. Skylar wrote, <laughs> looks like Josh and Jack need to have a bicep off. It's only fair. And I appreciate, Skylar, that you use the two different colors of emoji because diversity is a beautiful thing. It, it's, it is weird. I don't know. Okay, I don't know if you have encountered this, but I feel like people would look at me the way that I'm built and they'd find out I was like the guy from NPR 
And then you could hear their brain kind of reset like an Etch-A-Sketch. They just don't, they have no paradigm for that. And I kind of loved it. There's yeah, there's definitely a stereotype about uh, the the people who work in public radio, and um, <laughs> it's not always an incorrect stereotype. True, um, but I always I always loved being like. So when I was a reporter, I would I was like riding around on my motorcycle to get to stories just because I could skip traffic and you know ride through the lanes and park anywhere. And I was like, yeah, I'm I'm the guy who works for NPR, showing up in a, like a leather jacket, cowboy boots on on you know on the motorcycle. All right, let's talk about the story, and then we're going to do some informative whispering later on to tell people how it went. I like I like the. The informative whisper. Although the informative <laughs> whisper can get weird sometimes when you're talking about, like that informative BBC whisper, 897 people died today in a swarm of yes. killer bees. <laughs> the country yes. is in deep uh, mourning. You're listening to BBC. It's a little strange. Except uh, except for that one guy who's just like, BBC News. Right. Just the, like way too aggressive. With that very stentorian tone. Beyonce has a new mm -hmm. album out today that has set the world on mm -hmm. fire. Like that's even a little bit too much. <laughs> But yeah. I do, I do like being able to play with people's stereotypes about where you belong. Although maybe because you, it sounds like there was a piece of your heart that was always connected to being a little different, being a little more of a maverick. So I, I, maybe that's just kind of why it was always there. Cause you sort of on some level knew that you, that wasn't the mold for you. Well, I think it's, it's, I don't know if it was an active choice. It's just sort of, I've, I've never fully fit in anywhere. Um, you know, so first six years of my life, I spent probably 90% of that on a circus lot. And then, uh, when I was six, we left the big apple circus and I had kind of been going to normal school, just missing a lot of normal school. I was technically in the same school system K through 12. Um, but then, you know, I didn't quite fit in in the normal school because I was the circus kid and then I would go back to the circus to hang out with my friends there and their life was very different from mine and it was like sort of I was never fully I never fully fit, fit in anywhere even now you know being a full-time performer you know the way I live my life is still very different from most of the people um, who work at renaissance fairs rennies is the um the term that is sometimes thrown around uh for us but so I don't know that it was an active choice to be different of like, I want to be different. I think I just, at a certain point, I realized I am different and I'm going to stop trying to conform in ways that, you know, I don't feel like not conforming in this way is counterproductive. And I was like, I'm going to be me as much as I can uh, in ways that, you know, are not detrimental to my life and my career and don't hurt other people. Uh, but I'm going to stop like, I don't know. I'm going to stop wearing stuff other than cowboy boots because cowboy boots are the most comfortable thing that I own and I can slip them on and off. And I like the way that they look and they kind of look like work shoes if you're not looking too closely. So I'm just going to keep wearing them. Right. I can relate to, and I think a number of people, a few have expressed it in the chat, can relate to that feeling of sort of not fitting in anywhere. It's, it's, a, it's a hard thing in a way. I know it's been hard for me professionally. It's a great thing in a way because it sort of leads you to go, okay, We've, it's that old Sherlock Holmes thing, eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable must be the truth. And so the truth becomes like, okay, I need to find another way to navigate the world. I also think that some of what you said about that awkwardness that is different on stage versus off, which I think confounds some people who have a kind of a, a screwy view of celebrity, let's say, is resonating as well. I see Dana Bush, Bushell, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Dana, in the chat on YouTube who wrote, I get that. One-on-one, -on -one, no idea how to socialize or pretend to be a person. In front of a crowd, perfectly fine and outgoing. Dana, I appreciate you sharing that. I think that's not always an easy thing to say, but then it's also sort of the beauty of wearing masks and costumes on stage, right? Is that, and even being on the air, right? You're still kind of playing a character. You're playing this sort of, Imane, unsympathetic, not exactly a man, but more like a mannequin, right? Who doesn't yeah. feel too much about what's going on in the world around you enough to remain impartial and objective. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 you still have to kind of put on a persona to do that kind of work. Yeah, there's still, I mean, there's a huge performance aspect to radio. Um, and in a way, it almost made it easier because like putting on that mask of being, you know, impartial, 
uh, and objective made it easier to almost dissociate when the headlines were so bad as the headlines so often were. Um, but yeah, I, it's, I've, I've always found just being, becoming a character means that I get to get out of my own head for just that little bit. Um, and, and that seems to be just extraordinary in terms of just allowing me to get rid of that social anxiety, as I, as I said earlier. A lot of people have also commented in the chat about the energy that you bring to not only your work, but also to the people who, who come to your shows and who follow you online. Kristen wrote on YouTube, one word, joy. Like many others, the algorithms put his videos on my feed, and I realized I had forgotten how to laugh. I found joy again, and a wonderful fan community, and a pastime of meme making. KS on YouTube write, wrote, Jack, you are more than just a performer. You have truly created a community where it's okay to be different. You're a role model to your fellow introverts. Thank you for being you, Jack. We do love you. What have you found about the people who kind of connect with the work that you do? Uh, well, first off, thank you to both Kristen and KS. Those are wonderful, wonderful words. Um, what I have found with a lot of the people is, I, I think what I've what I've heard over and over again from people who come to my shows is um, how much they appreciated the laughs, similar to what Kristen said, how much they appreciated the laughs, especially during COVID. And I started late in COVID. I didn't start posting until October of 2021. Um, but a lot of people have said that it helped them get through you know, a difficult time or a tough time or a dark time. And at the end of the day, that is why <clears throat> I made this choice to go in, you know, into this industry uh, and, and, and change into this industry. Because at the end of the day, I have always wanted to make people laugh, um, find a way to make people feel better about themselves. Um, you know, there's a quote actually from my dad in the New York Times back in, I want to say, 1992, um, when they were profiling the Big Apple Circus. And he said, you know, anything you can do to help people escape the oppression that they feel in their lives, if it's, you know, just for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, that's a service in and of itself. And that's what I've always wanted to do. I wonder if I might, I might actually be able to find that really quickly. I'm going to see if I can hunt for that real quick. But I do want to play another clip of your performance on stage, pursuant to a comment from Skylar the writer. Skylar commented on YouTube, yeah. not gonna lie, that whip sound scares me. Like the entire time of that clip of Jacques, <laughs> I was scared he was gonna lose an eye, even though I'm looking at him still with both of them. I am sure there are plenty of people who see your performance and they're like, Oop, he, and they flip, and they just flip, flip, flip. They flinch through the whole thing because they're not exactly sure which way the next crack is going, and they might like I don't know. They might have a flashback to like Glory or Django, and they just don't know which way it's coming from. <laughs> but I, I mean, but I get that. Like it's dangerous, yeah. and it is also amazingly strenuous. I want to show a clip of you performing one song that apparently almost broke both of your arms for twenty dollars. Now I don't know how much reconstructive surgery you can get done with a 20, but I hope it's enough to fix what this man did to you. Watch. That you can't do through the fire and the Wait, flames. Wait, what, what are you saying? That you can't do through fire and the flames. Can't or won't? Yes? I don't know. All right, so my normal, all right, all right, all right, get out of here, I'm taking this 20. My normal response to this, this man just ran up with a $20 bill. All right, so my normal response, when everyone asks for fire and the flames, is do you want my arms to fall off? But you know what? Man showed up with a 20, and I am very susceptible to bribery. My arms are going to fall off, though. Oh, my God. You got this, sweetie. <laughs> afternoon at the Florida Ram Fest. Jackson Whippers on the stage, cracking whips in his blue vest. So through the whipping and the sunshine, well, it's really way too hot. People walk on by, say that Jackson Whipper is a thought. Oh, so through the sun and the sweat, we will keep on going and then 
my arms fell off, we will whip on. Is that acceptable? Keep clapping, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was, how do you, how do you reflect on that today? Um, I, I'm out of breath watching that. <laughs> I'm, I'm cringing at like, so like, I know I'm out of We're breath. We're exhausted watching it too. I'm breath. glad we have the same feeling about what you did. I would have been so mad if you would just be like, pep, 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 Next. I'd be like, mother, what, what are you, what are you eating? That I ain't eating. Then you can do that. He gave me a 20. I gotta give it, I gotta give it the full effort. But oh my God, that effort was... I mean, like, so I look at it in a couple of ways. Number one, I'm looking at the 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 speed of the whip. I'm like, oh, I, I was kind of flat on a couple of those notes. I couldn't quite hit that high note. And then I'm like, dude, you're 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 basically sprinting while trying to singing. Like, calm down, be be kind to yourself, and make up lyrics at the same time. Like, r relax. Um, but uh, that's that's you know, I think so. I'll put it in perspective. So, um, 2020, I set. Uh, a world record for most bull whip cracks in a minute, basically doing that back and forth as fast as I could for one minute. And to do that, I put on 10 pounds of muscle and I got 10 extra cracks out of that 10 pounds of muscle. So it is a workout and a half. Yeah, that uh, I was going to bring that up, that you did get the record for most bull whip cracks in one minute. Here it is on the website of Guinness World Records, 298 in one minute that was done on September 6, 2020, beating your own previous record of 289 bullwhip cracks in one minute. And then you also held the record 2016 as well. So that is, um, that is, that is a scary proficient skill. To that end, one of the questions that we also got from Skylar the Rider, which I think is is kind of a, a I guess a necessary question that we we need to answer. Skylar asks. Jack said he had some serious arms in that TikTok. Meanwhile, Joshua stays flexing in them medium <laughs> shirts. So who has the bigger biceps? The public deserves an answer for science. Jack, which one of us has the bigger well, biceps? Here, I, got, I got the measuring tape. You got measuring tape on you? <laughs> I'll be right back. No, no, no. I don't I came have, prepared. No, I don't have it handy. But don't think if I if I had another break scheduled in the show, don't think I wouldn't run get it. <laughs> I'm wearing a long sleeve shirt, so it, it's hiding everything. It's fine. Oh well, I'm not because I'm gonna. I'm Chuck's. I'm gonna like this. This is my Sun's show. This is out, my man. show. You're out in the desert. Let's go. That's right. This is it's my raining show. in Boston. Well, it just it just got sunny enough here in Las Vegas because it's been cold and windy. So now that I can wear my mediums, I certainly will. But to on a somewhat slightly more serious note, you did post an Instagram video not too long ago, kind of telling people to respect boundaries in terms of how to deal with you. I don't know if that's something that all kinds of performers that are like circus performers or acrobatic performers deal with to some degree, or whether there's something kind of, I don't know, I feel like to an extent when we're talking about Ren Fairs, Comic Cons, Fur Cons, there's a furry convention in Las Vegas this weekend, and a variety of other fandoms that we constantly have to remind people that Consent is consent, and just because I showed up wearing something that you find sexy does not give you permission to touch me or to do anything that I haven't consented to. And it seems like that keeps coming up for all kinds of people in all kinds of subcultures and fandoms. And from the video you posted on Instagram, you've had to deal with some of that too. Yeah, it's it's an unfortunate, I think, uh, part of the job. Um, and it, it the funny thing was earlier that weekend, a, a, a woman at the Florida Renaissance Festival who works there, um, literally the day before I posted that video, she had mentioned that she had had a similar experience with a patron. Uh, the day before, I had my experience with uh, a couple of patrons, to be honest. Um, it is not the first time that has happened. It is probably not the last time um, that will happen. Um, it, and for folks who didn't see it, basically, uh, the the polite way I put it is, uh, don't touch the display case. I know I wear tight pants, but don't touch the display case. Um, and it's, I think people, I had this conversation years ago with another performer, is I think when we're on stage... A lot of the time people see us as cartoon characters. They don't realize that we are real people. And so I think sometimes those boundaries get crossed. And sometimes um, there are just a lot of scummy people who who go to these conventions um, and who 
they have a couple of drinks and they turn into into douchebags. Um, they, I was I was very grateful after that um, happened. The Florida Renaissance Festival started putting a uh, security guard near my photo lines, and that was that was appreciated. Um, but yeah, it is it is an unfortunate part of the job. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry that it got to that point. I'm I'm glad they provided that for you, but that that yeah. should not happen to anyone. So, but I appreciate you saying that, and I wish I wish more people understood that like it's it's not for it's for public consumption but not necessarily for public like consumption yeah. the, the boundaries still matter let me focus more on some of our viewers questions for the rest of our time together shopping cd asked on youtube you've done quite a you've done a few streams for charities lately can you share why those are meaningful to you so i did two charity streams um in december and january one was for hope for the day um, basically, uh, the, the tagline being it's okay to not be okay. And, uh, we did that just before the holidays and that felt like a good time to do that. Um, you know, I think just about everyone will deal with mental health issues at some point in their life. Um, not always necessarily, you know, shall we say crisis mental health issues. Um, but either way, I think it's an important um, message to get across, which is that it is okay to not be okay. And if you, if you're having trouble, reach out to someone. And this is a, this is an organization that helps to provide those resources, whether in person or digitally for people who can't get to them easily in person. Um, they approached me about doing that stream and I was like, 100% done. Yeah, let's do it. Um, the other one was one that I wanted to do myself. And that was for the rescue foundation, um, rescue, uh, spelled R E S C U. And this is the Renaissance entertainers services and crafters union and essentially what it is and this is a gross oversimplification that they will not like but i'm going to oversimplify it uh it's basically health insurance for renaissance fair performers employees crafters staffers what have you um essentially an organization that helps um negotiate health care bills sometimes pay down health care bills um provide preventative uh health care including mental health for people who live on the road with renaissance fairs and many of whom are just living in their tents they don't have health insurance they don't even have you know any stable access to anything but they'll work in getting sunscreen dispensers added to renaissance fairs um they organized covid vaccination clinics they organized um std testing or i'm sorry sti testing um at renaissance festivals all this stuff to make sure that these people who in a lot of ways live on the fringes of society can still take advantage of you know the benefits of modern medicine which a lot of them cannot um so that's a big big um organization that i'm a huge fan of even as someone who still has health insurance now um i will i will continue raising money for them uh for a good long while and for those who are curious, I just found the site of Rescue Foundation. It's R-E-S-C-U foundation.org. All one word, R-E-S-C-U foundation.org. Let me get to a few more questions for you in the time we have. KS asked, being an introvert can be hard. Jack, what advice do you have for your fellow introvert performers? So making a character um really helps you get out of your own heads and that was part of the reason why i gravitated <clears throat> to doing jacques the whipper over jack the whipper because i had, i used to do cowboy shows where i was just jack the whipper and i realized that those shows were never quite as good as when i was jacques the whipper and i realized that being jacques the whipper allowed me to get out of my own head enough that it was the character doing the show i was more comfortable on stage um, as opposed to Jack the Whipper doing a show was just just me. It was just me doing um, my performance. And I was just, I wasn't as comfortable and confident on stage, even when I was wearing the exact same costume uh, and I was just saying that I was Jack the Whipper. It, it wouldn't be the same. Um, so making a character, especially if you have to just slightly tweak your voice. So my my this is my normal voice. The Jacques C. Whipper voice is just a little bit higher. It's not actually a good uh, French accent, but it's just a little bit higher. And it, it, it we, we move through the words just a little bit slower or sometimes a little bit faster. And it gives me the opportunity of when I'm telling a joke to drop the accent. So I can say, this is a joke. This is a joke. This is a joke. This is the punchline. And it allows you to accentuate all of that. It gives you something to play with a little bit. Vamp Lakin yeah. asked, what song do you wish you could do that you haven't done before? <laughs> uh, no comment. 
I, Wait, at this what? point they've gotten what you mean no comment they've gotten the most of the songs that i have ever possibly like at this point the only songs that i would kind of want to get requested are so niche and so weird that it would be for like two people in the audience so <laughs> uh at this point there's no real good answer to that the the one for a long time was the song from final fantasy 7 the video game from 1997 yeah that was the sephiroth theme song um and apparently all the nerds were waiting for that because that was one of my best videos of 2023 but that that was really the only one you had mentioned the rescue foundation and healthcare. talk about that piece of the adjustment i didn't want to get into that first but no. obviously the big question is like how are you going to pay rent how are you going to get health care? What do you do if you get sick? What do you do if you get injured on the road? You're doing something very, very physical. If you tear a rotator cuff, you know, you, you have, you're, you're married, you have a, a household, you have all these other things to deal with. Like the economic part of it must have been a conversation before you decided to make this leap. How did that work? So the way I was looking at it, so all, you know, I started getting the social media blow up on in October of 2021. Um, and I hit a million followers about three or four months later. And so all of 2022 was kind of dedicated to, okay, let's build up this side of everything and see if we can make this a proper business that if and when I do decide to leave WBUR, that the, on the financial side of things, I can hit the ground running. Um, so all through 2022 monetized Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, um, and then uh, get uh, the, the big thing was making sure that I could line up enough festivals that I knew I had a rough idea of what I could make in a day at a festival. Um, I ended up very much undercounting and very much overbooking myself, um, in 2023. So, uh, 2023, I worked, I want to say about five weeks more than I originally wanted to. And so I, I was, I was fortunate enough to, I'm making more money now than I was when I was working at the radio, um, which I am, I, I am very pleased to say. I was not sure that that was going to be a thing. But between you know, the revenue from social media and the performance revenue, um, it has been good enough that uh, my wife just quit her job as well to come on the road with me and be my full-time uh, photographer, videographer. So all those videos that you see of, of me on stage, those are filmed by her, edited by her. She does the captions on them. Um, because that's that's what she's always done. She was uh, she worked for the Boston Globe as a photographer for for many many years. Um, then worked for a wedding videography company. Worked uh, running social media, photo video for um, Boston University's School of Communication. And so, the last year, 2023, I still had health insurance through her. Uh, and because she also worked for BU, who owns WBUR, uh, I actually had the same health insurance uh now that is no longer the case now we are paying for the health insurance but um we we're making enough that so far so good as far as the injury side of things um what i do can be done even if i'm slightly injured um for example like i'm pretty sure my right shoulder i had i had uh surgery to repair my labrum in my left shoulder uh right after setting the world record uh from an old softball injury but I'm pretty sure the right shoulder has the same thing, which is a torn labrum. Um, and that does not hinder my ability to do the show. Probably hinders my ability to set any more world records, um, but I'm not trying to do that in the immediate future, so we're okay. Let me ask you a quick question about BUR before I go on to some more audience questions. And I don't wanna to monopolize too much of your time tonight. I appreciate you making this much time, but I wonder how you look at what the alternative for you might've been if you stayed. Not too long ago, the head of WBUR put out a letter to major donors saying, we might have to make very severe cuts. We are going to need your help. A few days ago, it was reported that WGBH, Boston's other major NPR and PBS station, is also possibly looking at making some significant cuts. A number of public media outlets have had to cut back, and some are very worried about how they are going to make ends meet. And then of course, you know, I used to be at NBC News, I was an anchor, and now NBC News is going through its whole drama over Ronna Romney McDaniel. So part of me f feels like, I wonder if one day I will end up back at that kind of echelon of the business. And then the other part of me feels like I must have gotten out just in time. And I feel conflicted about that because I loved the work that I did. NBC News is a really good place to be. Great people, 
wonderful people. They take the work seriously. They don't take themselves too seriously. I, I miss the people. I don't miss the industry. And I feel like for everything that's happening in the industry, some of which is self-inflicted, I kind of feel touched by an angel that maybe I got out just in time, even though I don't know precisely what the path looks like. How do you reflect on public radio, WBUR today, considering, as you said, financially you're doing better now on your own than they did for you? Yeah, I, I definitely do not regret leaving. Um, there was a stretch of time probably for about six months after I left WBUR, where I had almost nightly nightmares about being back at WBUR. Not that like, you know, like you're back, uh, you, those stress dreams where you're on the air and the red light indicating you're on air goes on. and you. Oh, I've never had that nightmare before. Screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. None of us have had that. Ever. Um, it wasn't even that dream. It was literally just that I was back in the building. Um just working there and those like and and the stress and the dread that i felt at those dreams was honestly worse than the other stress dreams that i'd had about working in radio so very quickly i realized um that i from for myself i had made the right decision but i i cannot see myself going back in any permanent form um for a couple of reasons one i don't think the industry I think the industry is on a downward trajectory, at least at the moment. I think journalism itself is going to have to have a big shift because people don't trust legacy media anymore. And there's so much, there's, there are so many ways to get your news um, that there's no longer the same kind of prestige that there was among the general public of being a journalist at you know, a place like the New York Times or NPR or NBC. You and I, I think, respect that because we know what it takes to get there. Um, and and the, you know, I, I, I think the, the level of quality control and assurance at those stations. But I don't think that's the case among the general public. Um, I, I, people are just as glad to believe something they saw on their friend's blog as they do on, you know, one of the one of the old old school legacy outlets. And that is a gosh darn shame. And I don't mean gosh darn. Let me get to a few more quick questions before I let you go. Kristen asked on YouTube, what lessons from your first year of full-time circus performing are you bringing to this second year? Uh, definitely taking more time for myself. Um, performed way too much last year. And I think put a little bit too much of myself out there and did not take enough time for myself and for uh, my wife. So one of my big, you know, people are like, what are your goals, what are your goals? My goal is to be financially secure and not work so much that it puts stress on my marriage and my, you know, my home life. That is my big thing. I'm a child of divorce. Uh, I don't want to go through that in my own life uh, ever again. So that's my main thing is making sure that I take enough time uh, for her, take enough time for my friends, my family, um, there was a point where I realized I was talking to, you know, fans of mine more than I was talking to friends of mine. And I was like, this, there needs to be a slight adjustment here. Um, now that doesn't mean like becoming a recluse and turning off all communication, um, with fans, but making sure I take some time for myself, especially when I'm starting to feel burned out versus, you know, when I get to the point where I'm like, oh no, I'm completely burned out. Um, I think finding that balance has been bigger for me and then it's just like little things like making sure you bring a chair uh so you can actually sit down backstage at renaissance festivals you know just bring just bring a lawn chair so you can actually sit and not be on your feet for the entire 12 hours you're there shopping cd asked on youtube where can we see you perform uh you can see me perform all over the country but the best place to find uh, my schedule, my full schedule for the year, jackthewhipper.com or jacquesiwhipper.com or jacklepiars.com. No one knows how to spell my name, so I just got all the spellings for my name. So, I, well, for those of you who will end up listening on the podcast, it's L-E-P-I-A-R-Z, jacklepiars, mm -hmm. all one word, dot com, right? Did I, did I get it right? Yeah. Okay. A, a number of people have been asking, and I'll see if I can find one of the comments. It was way high up in the chat. But a number of people have been asking about your cat, uh, and they wanted, I think they were expecting 
oh, your cat right, to kind of I, I will get him. paw right into the here. shot in just a second. Uh, there it is. There it is. Uh, am I saying the name right? Scipio? Am I saying it correctly? Yes, that's right. Yeah. So um, this is this is my cat who has anxiety and gets very angry and upset anytime I leave the house. And then when I get home, he gets really, really snuggly. And uh, we just got home two days ago. So even though he does not want to be held right now, he is purring ferociously. So, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the cat has become a real character in your uh, in your social media presence. And I, I think your cat might be owed royalties at a certain point because it's a character now. You know what? He's working on paying the rent. Um, he his his Instagram channel is slightly monetized. I think he's made five bucks off of whatever ads go on his Instagram account. But you know, he's doing his best. Skyler the writer also asked, "Is this Renaissance Fair coming to Los Angeles anytime soon? And what kind of food is at these things?" Yes, I'm thinking about <laughs> food. Two parts of this question. One, I think that's worth commenting on is that you're not actually with a particular fair, but you perform with a variety of events, right? Yeah. So I'm an, in, basically, you know, performers of rent fairs are all independent contractors. So there is a fair in Los Angeles, the Southern California Renaissance Pleasure Fair, which I think is in San Bernardino, maybe Burbank. I forget exactly where. Um, but so they run April and May. I don't perform that fair because one of the other whip acts on the Renaissance Fair circuit um, works there. And I'm friends with all the other with acts and I have a hard rule of, I don't work the shows that they work unless uh, they're okay with it. And it means they're not losing work. Um, so uh, that's the short answer to that one. Uh, as far as food, I mean, like you've got the staples of like Turkey legs and um, Turkey legs, uh, but <laughs> I, every festival will have different offerings for food, whether it's like, um, some of them will have chicken wings. Some of them have empanadas. Um, some of them have like Vietnamese food. Like it's, it's all over the place. It depends on which vendors they get. Um, but you can always generally get uh, something that will fit your palate and or dietary restrictions. If you have any, you had been on America's got talent a few years ago. Do you have any more aspirations of doing something national with your skills or are you kind of good with local performing and social media? I am so good not doing that again. That was so nerve wracking and stressful. People were like, I'm so sad you didn't go further on it. I'm like, dude, you don't understand. I got to go on national TV and it could not have gone better. I didn't make a fool of myself. And then I was done and there was no more chance for me to make a fool of myself. I am perfectly happy with the way that went. Um, and so... No, I, I am I am very glad that I did it. Uh, I have no desire to do stuff like that again. I still like performing for smaller sized crowds because you get to be more intimate with the crowd. You get to tell you know different jokes to the crowd. There you, you can you can kind of improvise a little bit more than when you. The bigger the crowd gets, the harder it is to improvise because you need to make sure that you're keeping the crowd with you. Um, another performer, a uh, friend of mine described it as a small show, small crowd. You can drive, you can swerve back and forth like you're driving a Ferrari and they'll stay with you because they're so engaged. But once you get a bigger and bigger, bigger crowd, it's kind of like driving a semi truck, a tractor trailer where you can make turns, but they need to be slow and gradual to make sure you bring everyone along with you. So uh, local performance is where I'm at. I, I think my biggest aspiration is I want to get international because I have um, a bunch of international fans. We have two of my Australian fans um, uh, on this video right now commenting. And it's like, I want to make sure that they have the opportunity to see the show live. But international is a whole different beast and a whole extra step. Before I get to my last question to kind of wrap everything up, I did want to mention for everybody who is watching on the stream right now, an upcoming interview that I would love for you to be part of. And I've had so much fun talking to you about all of this. This has just been delightful. For those of you who are watching, I would love to also get some of your questions for an upcoming interview, particularly those of you who are new to the show. Some of you who are fans of movies, big movie buffs may know that we are coming up on the 30th anniversary of Turner Classic Movies. TCM was launched back in 1994. And on this program, I will be interviewing its longest serving host, Ben Mankiewicz. He's gonna be my guest on the program soon. We are taping this interview. Unfortunately, it won't be live, but 
I will be talking to him about TCM, the past, the present, the future of the channel, some of the ups and downs that it's had, the challenges that it's had, including with its current parent company, Warner Brothers Discovery, and just the value of silent, of silent, of silent films and classic films and black and white movies in today's society and today's culture. I am a huge... TCM fan. So I am very much looking forward to this conversation. But if you have questions that you would like me to put to Ben Mankiewicz for our interview, or if you have stories about what TCM has meant to you, or what classic movies have meant to you, or just about those cultural touchstones that seem very hard to come by in our very splintered, fractured society today, please go ahead and email me. My address is joshua at nightlightshow.com. Be sure to include where you live and how to pronounce your name. I'll be taping this interview right right after Easter weekend. So you've got through the weekend, I'll even give you Monday to get your questions in. Be sure to include your name, where you live, how to pronounce your name, and I will put some of your questions to Ben Mankiewicz in our interview about the 30th anniversary of TCM, Joshua at nightlightshow.com. Before we go, Jack, since we've been talking about reinvention, rebuilding your career, rethinking this the direction of your life, for people who, as I said at the beginning, are like, I'm going to run away and join the circus. For people who are contemplating that kind of a big life shift and who've heard your story, what's the one biggest thing that you want them to take with them, whether they're joining the circus or not, before they make that kind of big shift? Maybe something that you wish you had considered or wish you had thought of differently before you made that kind of big shift, before we go. I, I think what I'm most grateful that I did was take your time with the move. You can you can start making steps if you're willing to put in extra work on the side, which I hate to say because I, I hate to be like those people like, you can pick yourself up by your bootstraps if you work hard enough. But if you have a clear roadmap for, you know, let's say I want to leave my job and do X, Y, and Z, and you know steps you can start taking now while you still work at your old job set aside an hour to a couple hours a week to start setting that up towards making that exit so that you can make it a little bit more seamless um giving myself that that year of prep time to get organized before i made this jump has been was was hugely hugely important um i could have probably quit my job in January of 2022 and been fine financially, but I'm so glad that I took that extra year to really set it up, get organized and really hit the ground running. Um, that has been a huge advantage. Um, and I can't, I can't stress that enough. Jack Lepiar is better known as Jacques Z Whipper online at jacquesewhipper.com, jacklepiars.com, and on Instagram as Jacques Z Whipper, J-A-C-Q-U-E-S-Z-E. Whipper, W H I P P E R. Did I spell that right? I think I. You did. Okay. You, you included the H, which is the most important thing. It's not Jaxi Wiper. Yeah, yeah. You uh, why? Yeah, you you posted about that. That a certain someone called you Jaxi Wiper online, which sounds like something mean that they say at the schoolyard in sixth grade. But they yeah. sh they, why, why would you say that to a man who's got a whip? Jack, I really appreciate you making time. This was so much fun. I really appreciate our viewers being part of this. Thank you so very much. I appreciate you being here. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Remember that we are going to have our conversation with Ben Mankiewicz. Be sure to get your questions in. Let me know what you would like to ask the long-running TCM host. Email me, joshua at nightlightshow.com. I really do appreciate those of you who've never been part of the show before, showing up, taking part in the conversation, sharing so much love. It means the world to me. Remember, you can find all of my links online at nightlightjoshua.com. You can email me either about the Ben Mankowitz interview or anything at all, joshua at nightlightshow.com. And to those of you who are observing Easter weekend, I hope you have a blessed Easter Sunday. Feel free to put some more comments in the chat, be in touch with me, and I hope to see you again next week on Wednesday for our next stream. Until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Thanks for making time for me, and please keep on shining. Trust me, someone needs your light right now. Yeah.